Hello, everyone, again. Uh, I hope you had a great time during the break session. And um, now I'm happy to present you Almerima Yamakovic Kapic. Um, she is uh, a senior data scientist at the Data Analytics and AI Group at Swisscom. Almerima, I hand over to you. Thank you very much, Marina. Thank you uh, again to all of you organizers. Wonderful uh, time. Um, hello from Bern to all of you who are listening. And I would like to start my presentation. Um, in today's presentation, I would like to share with you the main learnings and challenges my team faced when developing and building a real-time scalable anomaly detection system, which is now used to monitor streaming traffic data, but also other types of network operational data coming from the Swisscom network. So why are we doing this? Why are we building such a system? Firstly, and mainly because it allows Swisscom network engineers, our colleagues at Swisscom, to gain a real-time understanding of the state of their business, which is a network. So the goal is to gain a deeper understanding of the network, or to put it a bit differently, to be able to make smarter data-driven data decisions about the network operations that will later have all good implications to the business itself, like the obvious one, improved customer satisfaction, or a bit more um, uh, appropriate for our use case, like improved network operations. For example, when our network uh, colleagues uh, change some route policy in the network, they would like to know how this affects the propagation of the routing information or the traffic across the network or some other use case of a predictable network maintenance for example when a router or a link has to be turned off for the maintenance our network colleagues would would like to know which other link or router will take over etc 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 so in general uh, the goal is to automate the intelligent real-time monitoring capabilities and with that help Swisscom unleash the potential of data-driven networking. So how are we doing it? Uh, so for now we are using quite traditional technologies of big data analytics which currently in its simplest definition means application of a machine learning that will learn from historical data to identify some abnormal patterns in the network traffic in real time then we alarm our stakeholders and about these abnormal patterns and then our network engineer teams might take the next step of acting on this data typically this means some kind of a network operation as i just mentioned uh, so typically so far reaction to our system output or to our data science output has been a manual process but now we would like to start or we are starting to augment these traditional big data and an analytics uh, technologies with the uh, network automation techniques and hopefully more sophisticated artificial intelligence techniques to enable the next generation of highly intelligent networks which will be capable of uh, dynamically self-configuring, self-optimizing based on the challenging uh, and changing network conditions. So we are heading towards zero touch networks and the big data and analytics, these quite traditional technologies are the first and for now the main driver towards this goal. Good. Um, in this first part of my presentation, uh, I would like to talk about the challenges we faced when developing uh, scalable uh, streaming uh, big data pipeline, uh, the infrastructure itself. And in the next slide, I will talk about the challenges when building machine learning part of the system itself. So what you see in the right hand side of this uh, slide is the big data pipeline, which is in place. And the goal is to process a large amount of data in real time so that the accurate, complete and relevant information on one hand is presented to our machine learning part of the system, which is labeled here at the box called analytics. And on the other hand, the data is available to our network engineers when they want 
collect it when they want and however they want to slice and dice the data. So what you hear is that two aspects are visible. The real-time streaming component, which is labeled as a data processing part here, and the analytics data store component, which is labeled as a data store. So in the initial stage of building a big data pipeline, we were not worrying too much about data completeness because the data was coming from the network forwarding plane or simply the traffic, meaning that here and there one loss or non-accurate message didn't really matter. So when you deal with the traffic or, or um, it means that you have to aggregate a lot of a lot of uh, messages, and then that if you lose here and there uh, a message, the pattern of your time series does will not this will not have any effect on the pattern of your time series. What mattered was that of course you uh, do um, you you perform. Uh, acceptable accuracy uh, or you process at reasonable speed and acceptable accuracy and completeness. However, at some point, our network engineers decided they would like to onboard uh, also other types of data coming from the network, which is not the time series data, which is which but these are the events data, and we are talking about here data coming from the control plane uh, or the device data, how we call them. Basically, this type of data tells us how our traffic is being rerouted through our network and what are the states of those devices which are routing the traffic. Very important part, and as I said, these are not the time series data, so you don't aggregate anything on that. These are the events, so from this point uh, on, the accuracy and the completeness of big data sources and subsequent processing had to be exact if we were to use the processed and safe data for any further decision making. Just to, just to uh, tell you uh, about the volumes of data we are handling in, big, in our big data pipeline. So on the normal, uh, let's say, business day, we uh, the throughput through this pipeline is approximately half of a million of messages per second. And we, when we have special events like uh, we have uh, peak times or we have some routing protocols uh, and algorithms being, let's say, updated, then we have uh, to process up even few millions of messages per second. So we are talking about the big data, really. And when with such huge data set, limited data storage at some point uh, will raise the question, both because, as I said, we have the component, which is the analytical data store, but we also use the data, uh, historical data, to train our machine learning models. So at certain point, uh, we had to, um, we had a problem or challenge to determine which data source to gather, which not, how long data need to live to satisfy our stakeholders' needs. And eventually, after passing these hurdles of processing and the, uh, and the limited data storage, you are confronted with the question, the, the data which you have now in the pipeline or the data science which you actually, the results from your data science which you do with the data, are the results meaningful? And usually this question requires you to make several iteration of just mentioned points uh, to get you closer to desired and meaningful results. In our case, which meant that our, that our network engineer teams had the right visibility of the network. Good. Um, so let me just take. In the second part of my presentation, I would like to talk about the challenges uh, when dealing with the anomaly detection in real time, so the machine learning part of the system itself. And our approach, I believe, is not different from the others in the field. Uh, as I said, we use a machine learning uh, approach, basically a, some statistical model that learns from historical data. We make predictions, we compare uh, these predictions with the real world measurements based on the residuals. Uh, actually, we somehow decide whether this data point is anomalous or not. However, there are several things specific to the time series forecasting, especially when compared to the way standard machine learning problems are approached. And the first one is the obvious, the nature of the time series data. 
So in the time series, in the, in the standard machine learning approach, you would train a model, test, evaluate, you would repeat this process several times until you are happy with the model performance and then you would deploy it to the production. And usually this process is one time activity or you would do it, uh, you, you would do that at most at periodic intervals to maintain the model performance to take the new information into account. For time series model, this is ideally not the case because the real time series data or its underlying distributions are not stationary, meaning that statistical properties of your distributions will keep shifting as the new data comes in. So ideally for the time series data, you would have to repeat the standard machine learning problem as often as possible or even uh, ideally uh, every time you want to make a new prediction. Of course, this is not possible, especially if you do things in real time and in the production. So we end up with a method as anyone else, I believe in the field, which is based on the statistical assumption that most of the inflowing data are normal and that only minor percentage would be anomalous data. And how do you do that? They are two, we apply two uh, methods. One is by slicing your data into vertical buckets, basically saying that Monday's morning distributions of your data will have the similar statistical properties as any other Monday morning. The same holds for Friday evenings or the weekends. And then it's quite easy, right? Or uh, you can apply quite simple model uh, which is much more simple than the, 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 the mentioned one in which each predict or in which prediction for the next point is based on the horizontal slicing of data into windows. Another thing what you see on my uh, slide is a quite important one when dealing with a time series uh, forecasting or anomaly detection problem is the question, how do you know how good your model is when there are no label data uh, that a machine learning model can learn from it? <clears throat> and we solved this problem, on, initially we approached by uh, unsupervised problem, but this is quite hard. So at some point we decided to cast it as a supervised learning problem, which means that we inject different types of synthetic anomalies into the time series with the purpose of having label data that will represent some sort of true anomalies that may occur in real time or real life. Uh, Good. <clears throat> Second thing is um, the typical for the time series forecasting are the predictions themselves, and these are almost always going to be wrong. Just a for a comparison to understand better, uh, uh, like classical image classification problem, after applying the standard machine learning approach, you can expect that you are able to classify all new coming images quite accurately. Of course, given, enough that, given that you have enough training data and given that your training data and real world data are sampled from the same distribution. However, in the time series forecasting, the question is what are the chances that you are going to predict exactly that amount of traffic that you will have next point in time? So the chances are low. And uncertainty, and that means that besides the forecast itself or the prediction itself, you will have something that it's called uncertainty of your prediction, which is represented uh, as a, a light blue uh, bound around the time series and the predictions. And this uncertainty of your forecast actually represents the additional amount of traffic that you will have on the top your uh, on the top of your predictions to make sure that you don't alarm your uh, stakeholders all the time. And these bounds are also called confidence bounds or outlier bounds because they are simply used to determine if an observation is declared as an outlier or not. And the third point which I mentioned uh, here on my uh, slide is a practicality point, which is uh, when dealing with anomaly detection in real time, which is our problem here and dealing with thousands of time series that we have in our uh, data, you need to ensure that training and model selection can be done on the fly in the production. 
This means that you will have to have some kind of automatic model training and selection procedures uh, in, on the fly, and these will be essential part of the entire uh, solution space. Uh, however, um, ideally, in that case, you would like to have that each type of your time series, and you have plenty of them, will uh, fit to a different time series model. And of course, you don't have neither that much time, neither that much resources to do that. So you usually end up with some kind of uh, generic model or set of generic model, which you will actually apply, uh, which they uh, will apply to a certain group of time series, which have a similar properties. And when you do that, you will also have to accept that sometimes there will be a model that performs much better than the model that you end up with in the production. That is simply the price you have to pay when doing things in real time or in the production. So there is no free lunch. And finally, I don't know, okay. Yes, now it works. Finally, I would like to um, show you examples of the anomaly detections. Uh, or the alarms we send to our stakeholders, our engineers. And basically what you can see here is something that I call uh, good and bad drop of a traffic. <laughs> Maybe not just appropriate name, but let me explain you what I mean with that. On the right hand side, you see that uh, a traffic it's being monitored and at certain point there is a change in the traffic and our anomaly detection uh, system reacts to that. But we don't stop there. We go to into the root cause. We try to find what is the root cause behind this drop in the traffic. And we go into the data, which I mentioned in the beginning, those events data, because they are telling us how our traffic was rerouted or routed throughout the network and what was the state of our devices doing this job. So what we are trying to do here is what we try to, to find the root cause, whether the root cause of this anomaly is in our network or is it something somewhere else? Because we as a network provider, we are interested to solve the problem which are due to our network and not because there is some external factors. And what you can see here, the control plane BGP status is orange. Basically, this drop in the traffic was caused uh, th uh, most probably caused due to some change in the routing of this particular traffic. But on the other hand, you see that we also have some significant drop in the traffic. But when we inspected the, the corresponding control plane, the device data, we didn't found anything. So most probably here, the cause is outside our network. It might be also that our customers are simply, uh, simply stopped producing uh, the um, the traffic. And with this, I would like to close my presentation. I would like to thank you very much for uh, your patience, for listening, and please allow me just to say that um, uh, at Swisscom, we're always looking for good candidates, so please consider Swisscom in, uh, possible, in your possible uh, next career journey. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Almerima. So we mm -hmm. received a few questions. Um, the first one, what are the machine learning models you used for the anomaly detection in real time? I think, I hope I, it was, that was quite clear. So basically um, the, the main one, it is the bucketing model where we try to actually bucket our time series data into buckets so that the underlying properties are uh, underlying statistical properties are the same, and then you can do uh, whatever you want to do. Basically, then the range of uh, things that you can do is uh, quite wide. But we also, for example, have another models which are based on the extreme value theories, where we try to um, assess 
these um, anomalous data points. We also have, depends also on the underlying, of course, not every time series that we uh, have is a school example of the time series where you have, you know, the trends, etc. Sometimes we only, we have like the counting data and then the underlying properties are really Poisson. So basically we use then very simple uh, models to actually the to, to detect if these counts are um, outside or going beyond these averages. So we have quite quite a range of, of the models and of course depends on the underlying distribution. We try to find the best model. And we also use quite sophisticated one, but uh, yeah, sure. And one more question, how do you handle seasonality and some special events like large network outages and decouple them from model training? Uh, but I think I already answered yeah. this question, like, um, mm -hmm. And from, I also have a question, do you have also, what is the period of your prediction? Do you also split uh, your prediction to short time and uh, long or? No, we actually do only the one step ahead prediction that if that's what what's your question that we we, we are let's say uh, what we have done so far it was a challenging task of handling the big data pipeline the infrastructure itself because this is already quite challenging so that is now in place and now we are focusing our, our attention more on more sophisticated barrel or more accurate models so for now we were going just one step ahead predicting just the next point in time yes thank you very much Almerima. sure it was thank very you. interesting